This podcast is brought to you through support from our partner, the Kaliapea Foundation. The Kaliapea Foundation envisions a future grounded in compassion, respect, dignity, reverence for nature, and care for each other and the earth. Other programs supported by Kaliapea include the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance and Led to Life. To learn more about Kaliapea's mission, visit kaliapea.org. Hey for the Wild community, Ayana here. Last week we celebrated the five-year anniversary of this podcast. This marking of time came and passed so quickly, but it's a milestone that I'd like to take a moment to honor. In large part, this podcast was brought to fruition as a provocation. Looking around, I saw the cheapening of words, the objectification of life, and the dilution of truths, and I wondered how to move beyond shallow sensationalism or merry regurgitations when it came to storytelling, news, learning, and conversation. At that time, and still today, I felt deep rage, climate grief, and love for what I knew as wild places. My body and mind felt the compression of crumbling systems while witnessing white supremacy, capitalism, and patriarchy set fire to the world around us. Over the years, the collective and I have shape-shifted, grown, and reoriented our understandings because of the incredible guests we've hosted. It's been breathtaking and life-affirming to converse with some of the brilliance that has shared time with us. And my conversation with Bronte was such a strong reminder of this, and the importance of cultivating spaces to honor the voices of the revolution. As we continue our work, we recommit to our own humble, playful, and sometimes painful stretching processes in order to grasp our desires, feel the shapes of our dreams, and hold the complexity of our character. We will meet the flames of fire of an unknown future with a felt sense of liberation. We will taste our unbridled joy and freedom, and we will ask ourselves to identify what enables us to tap into the creative potential of our authentic selves. Within this personal and collective dreaming, I can't help but recognize the vital importance and great accomplishment it has been to continue on as an independent media source. While no doubt challenging, this has allowed us to speak to times of collapse and transformation without having to feign acceptance of false solutions or objectivity. However, when you reckon with the notion that objectivity is killing the earth, there is really no other option but to trust the power of truth. We will not yield to corporate strongholds or conform to watered-down notions of what is possible. We are held in transparency and integrity of our team. However, these are not endeavors that we can or should do alone. They require deep commitment and accountability to our community. And as for me, more than ever, I feel called to continue to be a provocateur, in the sense of reminding one another of the absolute irrationality of this world to explore new ways of telling uncomfortable truths, and to bring us back into our boldness. For myself, the erotic has been my teacher, reminding me that we cannot do reconnection work without looking at each other, the earth, and our bodies. I say this knowing that many understandings of the erotic have been cheapened, and we must work to reclaim the erotic as a power that can connect us, that pleasure and desire break the autopilot modality of oppression and modernity. And so, as For the Wild continues, much of our provocations must seek to bring us back to our senses. Stepping into our fifth year, we are opening the doors for collaborators, partners, and sponsors who are in alignment with our vision. For those of you who are listening right now and resonate with this message, please reach out to engage at forthewild.world. And for those who feel pulled to join our community and support, You can sign up for our Patreon as we grow our online community and learning lab around the conversations we hold on the podcast. For example, we're going to be releasing the full video interview with Bronte over on Patreon, where our patrons will be able to watch and laugh alongside us as we delve deeper into conversation. And the last thing is that I'm going to ask you all a personal favor, to rate the podcast on iTunes and to follow us on Spotify. I'd like for you to know that we don't take this lightly. The team reads and cherishes all the feedback we receive. Your messages and posts are truly felt and nourish us in this work. Thanks, everyone. And with that, now on to part two of my conversation with Bronte Velez. 
Bronte Velez, they, them, is guided by the call that, quote, black wellness is the antithesis of state violence. Mark Anthony Johnson. A black Latinx transdisciplinary artist and designer, they are currently moved and paused by the questions, quote, how can we allow as much room for God to flow through and between us as possible? What affirms the God of and between us? What is the way? How can we decompose what interrupts our proximity to divinity? What ways can black feminist placemaking rooted in commemorative justice promote the memory of God, which is to say love and freedom between us? You know, we previously discussed talking about the idea of pleasure in the apocalypse, which I so often come up against, the idea that we can't find joy because the world is burning. And I know a lot of people feel that way, and that we can't be in our bodies because we need to be in the struggle. And of course, I'm drawing upon so much of Adrienne Marie Brown and Audre Lorde's work who negates this and proclaims that actually... When we're in our pleasure, our capacity is stronger because we can't be powerful if we are denying ourselves our full existence. So I'd love to hear you introduce your thoughts around this and if you have any thoughts on moving beyond the binary of pleasure versus suffering. And you kind of started touching on that or like around the proximity of suffering. Yeah, well, I want to first name like I've been really grateful for Pinar from Queer Nature's reflections on concepts of pleasure are often only sexualized. So what I'm about to speak to is like the dynamic ways we might encounter pleasure that could not be sexual or the expansion of the erotic into, you know, something that is maybe not just encounter sexually, though I encounter it. <laughs> I encounter pleasure often <laughs> sexually. Mm-hmm. Um <laughs> I didn't know it was going to be so hot. You know, the sun's really beaming down right now. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, yeah, it w- it makes a lot of sense to me. And I have a lot of compassion for the immense suffering that is happening, has happened, is happening, and is going to continue to happen to those most vulnerable to climate apocalypse and collapse and just the ways that, you know, ways people are already not getting their basic needs met, the ways that that will intensify. And it's scary. And it's hard to imagine what you're saying, a capacity for still being in joy when it really feels so unknown. It feels so mysterious. It feels so scary. I feel like for me, Pleasure is a daily meditation of embodiment, listening into a pulse of, does this feel right to me? And does this bring me joy? Does this make me come alive? And I think then we are more oriented towards what is ours to offer when we're listening into what makes us come most alive. I can't think of the, I can't think of who it is that says this, but Esperanza Spalding was bringing this up. It's in Farming While Black, and I've heard it multiple times, but it's it's someone who says, we don't need people doing like what they think folks need. We need people doing what makes them come most alive because that's what we need right now. And I feel like that's at the center of us being in our pleasure, which might be our ecological niche. I think it's important to interrogate if our relationship to what brings us pleasure is from a socialization of continuing injustice, I think we should interrogate what brings me pleasure and why, because some people right now are down for, for stuff that brings them pleasure that is, harm, that is harmful to the land, that is harmful to other people. I don't think that's an accountable form of pleasure, but I feel like this idea that we're going to be liberated through continuing feeling suffering or like feeling grief or being wrapped up by isolating ourselves or letting it all fall on top of us. If you're going through that, and I can see how people may not be resourced to not, you know, not go through that own collapse. Yeah, I've been like in this submission role with collapse and with the earth of just like, take me. 
I'm on my knees and I want you to tell me what position do you want me to be in? Because I'm in a place of like, what do you need from me? What are you asking of me? I'm devoted for you. I'm fully devoted to you. I'm on my knees to the earth right now. And just like, and to Black people, Black people's liberation. I'm like, what, what is needed for me? And the, and the voice that I keep hearing is be your gifts, be in your power, be in your love, be in your pleasure, because we need that vibration right now. We need a vibration right now collectively that is centered around us being able to have the capacity to dream something else into being. And I think that that comes from a place where we're in orgasmic, ecstatic states. Like, I think that will come from like creating cultures of healthy ecstasy that bring us into trance, into listening, that jolt us into like, letting our bodies be channels and conduits for liberation. And that that can be like really exciting to be in that place where like, I can't even access what the earth is asking of me and my role and responsibility right now, especially if my shape, for example, folks who can't see, I'm like turn inward and like shrinking. How is the energy of love and freedom able to enter me when I'm like, literally my shape is like this? And I know people experience chronic pain, chronic suffering, and there's so many ways that I was talking with a former professor, Greg Childs, about, he was talking about the ways the academy and white supremacy deforms us and limits our capacity for pleasure physically, because some of us, especially folks encountering environmental racism, depression from this six mass extinction, all of these things, it's hard to feel your capacity for pleasure. and. I think that, yeah, that that can be elevated when we're in community with folks. Who are you calling in to help you out? Who is your support network? Who do you know who can, who can you call together to be in some, and to shift maybe just, yeah, isolation is going to create more suffering. So, and maybe it's not humans. Maybe you call upon, maybe you call upon the land or ancestors or, or benevolent like spirits to allow you to open up just the prayer of like opening up, may my capacity for pleasure be opened, make up my capacity for, for joy be open. I've been praying recently. May I have so much space creator for psychic freedom, please. I need as much space for psychic freedom as possible. Please move any barriers out of the way that are preventing me from having psychic freedom so that I may may facilitate that pleasure for others. If I'm feeling good, other people are definitely going to probably feel good. Yeah, that's liberatory. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with you that when when one is in that orgasmic state of being alive and in their bodies and their pleasure and their erotic eros senses, people are drawn to that. People are hungry to feel alive and embodied in something that can shock us out of our autopilot mode of being in modernity. Being in modernity with technology and industrial civilization, I'll just speak for myself, it cuts me off from my orgasmic state because it takes my attention away from my body, away from most of my senses other than just the sense that the screen, you know, per se is trying to capture at that moment. And, and, And we're talking about regenerative power. We're not talking about you know, we're not talking about destructive power here, but when one is in their power, in this connection to the divine, to Eros, to the erotic, which I think is all the divine, I think they're all synonymous with one another. I think it also, it sparks in people that, wow, could I feel like that? Could I possibly tap into that energy? And then it's like this curiosity of, well, what do I have to release about myself, about my identity, about my conditioning? about my consumer addictions in order to begin to feel this alive with the earth. Because it's always with the earth. I don't think it can be apart from the earth body when we begin to feel our own bodies awaken with the pleasure of what it is to be alive, even in this time. And I think there's something subversive about being able to hold that amount of pleasure while we're also holding the hospicing and the grief and to be able to feel the intensity of all of the spectrum of emotion 
like what Jonah Macy talks about the beauty and the terror together. It's such a delicious way to be in this time. Like I would much rather be in this empowered place of feeling at all than feeling like, you know, it's toppling on top of me and I can't I can't possibly get out from underneath the bricks. Similarly, you mentioned thinking about the process of seducing people into liberation and questioning what is the capacity and limitation of sensuality in this paradigmatic shift? Like how does making movements a sensual space open opportunity for different kinds of engagement to emerge? Like what is the role of playing with erotic energies and muses? That being said, it also feels incredibly important to me to name that this conversation takes on different meanings and interpretations for those who have experienced different forms of trauma and shame around sensuality. So what does it take to hold a container of safety for folks to engage with movements as a sensual space? I love it. I want to be in my senses. Is when I feel most wild and I feel most in my calling, if I'm like just able to feel myself as a part of the body of the earth, we all deserve that, that memory, that knowing, that wisdom, that, yeah, we should all be able to access. And I think, yeah, it feels sad that like in our ways that we play with like resistance work and encounter our activism, yeah, and especially I, I think in relationship to neoliberalism, there's just these ways that they're disembodied. The ways we're organizing are not accountable to people's bodies or people's rests or like what's actually the capacity of a human body and life to do a thing. I don't agree with like still taking us into these same sort of industrialized ways of getting towards liberation in like that we are like industrial machines that have no need to rest or to feel or to deserve especially yeah pleasure so I think sensuality is so important and I think for folks who have had experience with trauma and sensuality and and where that sadly for so many of us has been cut off so many of us, that cord has been cut for what that means and just flattened for what that means. Yeah, for me, like being in our senses can can come in such a multitude of ways. And when I just finished Ginny O'Dell's text around resisting the attention economy, for me, it feels like when we live in a culture that's so predicated on taking away our senses, literally everything about the culture is in design. The experience of our technology right now is all about anesthesia. What are the ways that we can make connections that reorient and redirect our attention back towards the earth and back into the vibration of our senses, of our listening, of our listening to our ancestors? And for me, the project of folks who so sadly are socialized who have learned to utilize sense connection in ways that are unjust, in ways that are are harmful. And when I think about like advertising, I'm like, it's so sad that like the culture of advertising is rooted in like actually really understanding what our eyes move towards, like how our hearts are open, how we connect to things, what colors might we use? What sounds might people like and, and tune up to or, or redirect their, and focus their attention? And I feel like sometimes in culture and politics of activism, we're not appropriating this way that this whole culture of capitalism is moved both by our shame and also by like drawing us into our senses, into our pleasures, into our desire. And so I think it's both about this whole thing about like making the revolution sexy and also like what would it be like to support people in reorienting what we think we desire, what we think we want and to make being in the earth actually something that's very sexy. I think a lot about this as someone who grew up in young black Atlanta and I'm blessed to have grown up around support as a young artist and support with black artists around me, raising me. And a lot of the people that I grew up with, a lot of people are like, 
they're just showing up and showing out, you know, they're, they're really, you know, quote unquote, making it, they're doing their thing. And also I've asked myself a lot, how do you ask a dispossessed people to renounce possession? How do you support the reorientation of desiring perhaps something that is life affirming and not like material oriented? And for me, I'm like, how do we gather in public space to reorient and redirect our senses, how do we appropriate propaganda? How do we think about the practice of memetics in our work? I think about that a lot with Led to Life. Of The work with Led to Life, which one of the parts of our practice is transforming weapons into shovels. And for me, that's just about knowing, really, it's so powerful when people hear it, they're like, whoa. They're drawn in, they feel the power of it. But that's not really the work. We don't need to make more stuff. We don't need to make more things. That practice is wasteful. We try to limit like how many shovels we make because what the real part is, is that we know that spectacle is what people are drawn to. People came to our ceremony in Oakland in January because I'm imagining they wanted to see a gun turn into a shovel. Not everybody, but like, that's kind of fun to go watch. People are moved by these Colosseum, these weird things, these kind of Roman traditions and paradigms of like going to see spectacle. And that has been used for terror for so long. Lynching spectacle right now, the new technologies of racial terror lynching with watching Black people be harmed by police, that spectacle. And how do we reorient people towards encountering something that makes them pause? that makes them feel their body, that makes them feel their breath, or invites them to feel their breath, invites them to remember their senses, invites them to rest. And yeah, I think art especially does that. And um, I think one of the main ways oppression continues is, yeah, by taking away our, our senses. Come down, come down, revolution. Come down, come down, revolution, come. Oh, 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 oh. Come down, come down, revolution, come down, come down, revolution. I'd like to read a poem by Rainier Maria Rilke translated by Joanna Macy, who has been a dear teacher to Bronte and I. It's entitled, Go to the Limits of Your Longing. God speaks to each of us as they make us, then walks with us silently out of the night. These are the words we dimly hear. You, sent out beyond your recall, go to the limits of your longing, embody me, flare up like a flame, and make big shadows I can move in. Let everything happen to you, beauty and terror. Just keep going. No feeling is final. Don't let yourself lose me. Nearby is the country they call life. You will know it by its seriousness. Give me your hand. I feel like we've had this conversation around what it would be if the movement was sexier for so many years and the seduction of feeling good and and seeing what advertising uses. Like, what does the dominant culture use to seduce us? And why are we not using those tools to seduce people into another direction. It's that same type of feeling of like, you can't look like this, you can't use those tools, you can't be powerful. You have to maintain a proximity to suffering in order to qualify as an activist, in order to qualify as somebody who can be respected in certain movement spaces. And I'm really in a place where I just wanna 
toss all that out the window and say, hey, whatever we've been doing isn't really working. So can we look at what does work and actually utilize those tools with integrity, with love, with devotion for a greater good, and also be creative, make art and have a fun time while doing it. And I'm not blaming anybody for this. I think it's a product of oppression. Now it's time in my mind to shift this way of relating to being an activist and not letting these cultural oppressive tactics bleed in and then stop us from being our fully erotic creative selves. But I I do want to talk a bit more about the value of aesthetics and more specifically, perhaps we could talk about when aesthetics are developed as a strong ideological alternative to dominant notions. For example, the creation and nourishment of black aesthetics. So how is this an example of the importance of looking good and being empowered in the self through style and identity? What is beauty's role in liberation? We definitely, with Led to Life, are thinking a lot about beauty and decentering Eurocentric concepts of how we understand beauty, what shapes that looks like, heteronormative concepts of beauty. Yeah, thinking about the root of aesthetic just meaning sense, senses, that's what it means. So thinking about like, for me, Black aesthetics is about Black senses and a Black cultural traditions that made sure People were down to still look good through and through. I'm so moved by like a culture of of what feels like protection and reverence and camouflage. Just the ways that stepping out maybe like brings attention to people, you know, like when you're out there looking good or when you're when you're creating something that looking good that draws people's attention toward you. But I think in another way also it serves as an intervention, especially for Black people. Blackness has, there's been so many projects a part of white supremacy to eradicate the idea that Black is beautiful. So I think in a way to reclaim that, I'm going to still practice the kind of care it takes to adorn my body, which is a sacred vessel. I'm going to honor this vessel that has been unloved, that has been devalued, that they want to harm. And it it makes me think of Baby Shug's, a character in Toni Morrison's Beloved, this section called The Clearing, where Baby Shug's is like, they're never going to love your body, so you need to love it. She brings all of these people in the community into this clearing, and she has them touch up on their neck. Touch up on all your organs and your body and your flesh because they want to do away with your body. And so for me, it's so important to me when I see people who like want to just to dress themselves and they're just their own body. Like that is such an important thing. And then I think that like beyond that, like I think we're all kind of there's something from this uh, documentary, The Cruise, where he's talking about rising to the occasion and just wanting people to rise to the occasion of the day, rise to the occasion of being alive. And I feel like we're not rising to the occasion of, we're not rising to the occasion of being alive in the earth. And that doesn't need to require money or, or makeup or any of or these things to look good. It's not about looking good again for like Eurocentric notions of beauty, but like what makes you feel good And what do you see as beautiful and how might adorning yourself in that be a way of protecting your liberation and facilitating for others the trust that something else is possible? I know for some people, it endangers them to embodying what they feel is beautiful. For some people, they've had to neglect that because heteronormative and Eurocentric understandings of beauty, it's not been safe for people to actually like fully to fully move into what they feel is beautiful. But yeah, what a courageous thing, I think, for like queer Black community to be like, I'm going to fully embody and dance into what I see as beautiful for femmes, for women, for everybody, (laughs) for everyone to come into like, yeah, I want to be in my beauty. 
I think it's so important, especially when we've, yeah, we have so much shame and insecurity around ourselves. I know I do all the time still. And like, it's so sad. It's so, 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 so sad. And I'm afraid sometimes, not only in myself, but just in what I, what I offer to my relationships, to, to the earth. I feel like I offer half of myself because we haven't been taught that it's safe to be in our air beauty, especially when the ways I've heard you talk about this, Ayana, when oftentimes the ways we encounter beauty and the ways we relate to beauty is to extract, is to take from, is to, is to think I want some of that. So I think there's something that you spoke to about subversion and beauty. I think there's something that we've been thinking about with led to life around how do we keep these kind of these boundaries and container around beauty where people are drawn into something very beautiful, very liberating, but where you can't take from it. It's protected. Yeah. It's fortified. Yeah. And I think, I think there's a lot of liberation wrapped up there. Mm -hmm. To be able to just experience beauty and see a wild being and just have pleasure in just the experience of knowing that that exists is beautiful. We can see a rose. That doesn't mean we had to cut it and then bring it into our house for us to experience the beauty of seeing a rose blossom. I mean, I'm using a rose because it's so metaphorical for beauty in our culture. But I do think that there is something about the safety of beauty. And, and that's something I've had to work through a lot around, oh, well, if I show up in my full regalia, Will I be hurt in some way, shape, or form? And I want to speak to those people who do feel scared. And for a true reason, people have gotten hurt in their bodies. And I really think that this experiment in our minds of how we can work through, even in our own lives, experiencing beauty without extracting it. And then you spoke to adornment. And I remember speaking with Martin Prechtel years ago, and he talked about the people in Guatemala and how they would adorn themselves to farm. They would weave these incredible tapestries over their body to, for the divine. This wasn't just for them to look good. No, I mean, of course, yes, I'm sure they would probably feel beautiful when they put on these incredible outfits. It's about courting the mystery, courting the divine, showing up every day in this erotic, beautiful way to say, hey, earth, you are beautiful and I am going to show up to be beautiful for you. I want to show up to be beautiful for my relationship to the divine. There is a lot of depth to beauty that gets completely erased because of capitalism. Our relationship mm. to it gets tarnished. It becomes something pornographic rather than something spiritual. And yeah. um, I also want to say, I was thinking about my last you response. Better say that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 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 I've I've definitely been feeling the connection to the erotic spirituality and and uh -huh. it's so much beyond sex. It's not about, oh, yeah. you have this erotic energy, you just need to have sex and then it will go away. I don't ever want it to go yeah. away. I don't I'm not trying to satisfy no. it's not about satisfying the erotic energy. It's about tending to yeah. the erotic energy. It's about yeah, uh, yeah. taking care of the erotic energy, uh, worshiping the erotic mm -hmm. energy, because mm -hmm. that is this You contrast. sound grown. Ooh, ooh, I feel it. <laughs> I feel it so much. And I, I know patriarchy is very threatened. Patriarchy mm -hmm. is very scared, especially for feminine uh, or female identified folks who, and honestly, queer folks too, Patriarch is very mm -hmm. scared for anything other than them to mm -hmm. be able to hold the erotic energy. It's okay for them to be mm -hmm. wanting sex all the time or be erotic. That's okay. But somehow when it's the others that other than them, it's threatening, it's scary, it's too much, it's too intense. And I really want to put resistance to that and tell all the people out there that are listening to feel a type of gratitude and honor to be able to feel so alive and and there was something I wanted to speak to with my last response. I was talking about the pressure of the movement spaces. It's by design that these wounds are put into movement spaces. I really respect people in movement spaces. It's not even that I blame them for those things because I know it's not even them who have put these restraints on others. It's a way of just living through the trauma that is from 
honestly, I think coming from the outside within. And so I just wanted to clarify my thought because it wasn't thought out as clearly when I said that. But my own journey with the awakening to the Anthropocene, to climate change, to global suffering and the Aramacene, the age of loneliness and capitalism and colonialism and all the isms that are just horrifying. So much of my journey was a lot about shame and guilt and feeling so heavy and feeling like I can't possibly be happy, erotic, pleasured. I can't possibly have those things because that means that then I am not fully aware of what's happening. For me to be fully in my awareness meant that I had to be suffering alongside and a lot of self-inflicted suffering, a lot of self-inflicted guilt all the time. And that to me felt like, okay, well now I'm being more authentic because I feel like crap all the time and everything is crappy out there that this must be a way that I am a better human. I'm really seeing the realities and I'm really embodying the realities. And it's taken me a long time to get into this place where I feel that pleasure and feeling joy is actually beneficial to the movement. And I don't think that shame and guilt don't have a place. I was speaking with Padre Gotwama, who's an Irish poet, a couple months ago, and we talked about shame and guilt. And and I don't think that those need to be eradicated from our messaging about what's happening. I think it's kind of hard not to make decisions that are negatively impacting other beings at this point. Just the way our system is set up, everywhere we turn, we're hurting somebody. And it's horrible to be in that in that type of relationship that's forced upon us. We're forced to be perpetrators. And Mm -hmm. it's a horrible, horrible feeling. And so I think the shame and guilt is important for us to really acknowledge and to know that, yes, many of us are complicit in this. I don't think that staying in that is going to get us out of it. I think it's an important place to acknowledge, to work through, to come to something like gratitude for what is still living and ourselves included. But Yeah, the balancing of the shame and the guilt and the pleasure kind of goes back to this idea of just feeling the full spectrum that I think it's completely possible and something I'm really noticing in myself. I can feel completely somatically turned on and pleasured and at the same time feel the grief of what we're losing and feel the grief of my role and my complicity in the suffering of other beings. And it goes back to the thing, like we can be all of ourselves. We can be the self that is getting it and looking good. And we can be the self that goes home and cries and we can be the self that then wants to needs to rest. And we can be the self who just wants to power through. And, and I know for myself being able to come to a place where none of those pieces of me need to be shut down. Mm -hmm. The release that can come and then the power that can come to be on our knees to the earth and saying, I am all here. All of me is here. All of my beauty, all of my shame, all of my guilt, all of my pleasure, like is here for you to direct, is here for you to tell me what I should do with this emotional capacity. It's deep. It's very liminal. You can have a safe word with the earth. I think people who really care right now, who care so much, who want, who have like their compassionate hearts and love and want to want to show up, you know, similar to what I was saying about like creation, I'm on my knees for you and like do with me as you please. It's kind of like, I would like to, you know, just with that prayer, add on some more specifics of like, and please be gentle on me and please, (laughs) please let there still be capacity for me to, to find the imagination for pleasure in my approach toward liberating my complicity and systems of oppression. May I have the capacity to imagine that there's pleasurable pathways, there's hilarious pathways, there's joyful clowning trickster pathways to do this. And like, it doesn't have to be through these modes of suffering that have gotten us here. That doesn't make sense for us to continue to to embody that suffering and to just notice and touch into the ways we've internalized that and to ask for support where we can and how we can and to be mirrored in that. I think it's really important. I just feel excited for like liberation movements that touch into that capacity. I've done things where like recently I am completely embodying a refusal to be desensitized or to normalize 
what is going on right now, to normalize suffering, to be desensitized to suffering, to be able to scroll through suffering. I'm at a point where I'm willing to allow myself to encounter the indigestibility of it, to encounter the shock, though I'm not shocked, to allow my body that space to touch into the suffering and then to be also willing to know that it's not accountable to the earth to then isolate myself in that, in that grief. That is not going to help anybody. And I've done that so many times where I feel like I'm the only one feeling how I'm feeling. And I'm feeling like this is just, you know, I feel mad. I feel sad. I feel mad. Like I'm crazy. I'm like going crazy. Um, And I know a lot of people feel that sensation. And sometimes for me, I'm somebody who it's very hard for me to reach out for help. I feel like I've been socialized to be able to show that I can do things on my own and that made me successful or powerful is that I'm a powerful, badass Black woman because I can do everything. I'm bad all by myself kind of kind of thing. And it's been hard for me to say I need help. It's been hard for me to say, can you help me revive pleasure? Can you touch me like this? <laughs> can you hold me like this? Would you be willing to affirm me before you say something like that? Can you... Uh, Can you validate the grief that I'm feeling? And then sometimes, you know, like if you see your friends or people in your community who are isolating themselves, especially folks who are on the front lines or folks who are in in movement work, reach out to them. Ask folks how they're doing. Like, especially I think people who people idolize or pedestalize and see them as figures. And that's happening a lot right now with social media and like kind of these like movement leaders who are helping us imagine another way is possible. That shit's got to go in terms of seeing people as like these all knowing figures who don't experience pain. I think both for those who are empowered to be transparent that we need support. And then for people also to not hold people to that. I feel so sad about like Greta Thunberg and Chuteska and these kids right now who are you know, doing this youth be gov work. And I'm just like, how are these children doing? Are people protecting and supporting these children's health and wellness and pleasure? Like, are they getting to be children? Are they, are these kids going to be, get to be kids? If I have a kid, will they get to be a kid? You know, the scariness of that. Yeah. So I, I definitely, you know, it takes a squad. It takes a circle. It feels already really good and expansive to be (sighs) <sighs> to be saying, yeah, to be calling in like a pleasurable way of of moving towards liberation. Um, and it's just something recently that I'm I'm like able to not just preach about, but to actually feel. I just want to shout out Trisha Hersey, who I name as my minister, the Nat Bishop of the Nat Ministry, who Trisha, when we first met, I just felt like it was more worthy to be an activist that could talk about how tired I was, how exhausted I was, how much suffering I've experienced, and that that made me more relatable and more, what you're saying, more authentic. And I'm just, I feel so much joy around Adrienne Marie Brown, Trisha Hersey's politic of pleasure, of rest, of building up capacity. Um, And I know that that's sometimes a privilege and oftentimes a privilege to be able to feel that. So I'm feeling that gratitude. And I'm like, for those of us who have capacity to rest and to have access to the psychic freedom to practice nonviolence, et cetera, how are we making sure we're facilitating more spaces for people to be in their bodies, in their senses with the land? Yeah.
This whole conversation is so potent for me. I love you so much. Mm -hmm. And love it's been too. so expansive to explore this with you and feel safe to just say these things that mm -hmm. feel like I didn't even have capacity or access to before, maybe even this year. And I agree, like what I, you know, when you were saying you may pre have preached these things, but you didn't feel them embodied. Yeah, I remember reading Adrienne Marie Brown's work and I was like, okay, I like this concept, but it's not me. I'd always think that like, okay, this is a, uh, the earth body is my body. You know, I'd hear these things. I'm like, yeah, 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 but that's not me. And for the first time to be able to embody these concepts is so beautiful. So I, I want to say too, for the people out there that feel that they couldn't possibly embody what we've been talking about or things they've been reading, I'd just say stick with it. Stick with it and keep keep listening, keep slowing down enough to transition. So I think that's what it took for me. It took a lot of time to be in the questions and to be in my own frustrations with it and to be a cynic. Uh, it didn't come quick and it didn't it didn't come when I wanted it to. It just I feel like was like a lightning bulk strike where like all of a sudden it was just like psh here it is. And I'm very grateful. And yeah, the privilege of being able to choose pleasure is, I, I would say, one of my my most incredible privileges of this life. I feel so lucky to be able to acknowledge and, and choose to feel, to feel all the feelings, honestly. But I do want to give you a clean slate to say anything that hasn't been said, any projects you're working on, any ways people can support you. Yeah. Thanks, Ayana. Yeah, well, if there's anyone like feeling that feels discouraged or maybe like the I concepts of pleasure can, I've seen things around like this kind of spa or capitalist cultures of self-care and pleasure making that don't have to be wrapped up in that and just, yeah, a friend who is a doctoral candidate at UC Berkeley in Black Studies um, and also one of the co-founders and co-conveners of something called the Church of Black Feminist Spot, Ra Malika Imhotep. My friend Ra, she talks about how um, she does this work that is the intersection between burlesque and Black women literary figures or black kind of women archetypes just kind of encountering the possibility of an erotic life when women were enslaved or women who black women who have experienced suffering that there were possibilities for an erotic life and that people were even in 
our ancestors, even who were navigating extreme horrors, still located pleasure. People fought to find their own kinds of paths of still finding pleasure, even if it was in small and quiet ways. So I just want to honor that. Yeah, I just feel like there's a lot of fugitivity available through the act of like being in pleasure, embodying pleasure at this time. That's a way that we can actually protect ourselves from the internalized oppressions that are that are trying to like keep us down, keep us from continuing to support life, trying to keep us burnt out like this whack. And yeah, please continue to support our work with Led to Life that is all about pleasure. And we're moving more into us as a queer collective that is committed to to beauty and pleasure in the world. So you can visit us at ledtolife.org or follow us on Instagram at led, L-E-A-D, the number two, life. And yeah, me and my partner, Jordi, are beginning a practice called kinesthetics, which feels akin um, to everything we've been speaking to about how do we still continue to practice beauty with our artistry, with our scholarship? What would it mean to rewild our practices and our, our work and to devote ourselves to the earth and to still to still show up to the to the gravity of beauty, but it not being when that's not occupied by capitalism. Uh, what happens to our imaginations? And yeah, more on that if you follow me at Little Nails mm-hmm. on Instagram. And mm-hmm. um, how can people financially support your work? You can donate at ledtolife.org slash donate or my Venmo is at Bronte Dash Velez. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for listening to another episode of For the Wild Podcast. I'm Ayana Young. The music you heard today was from Jennifer Johns the members of the Thrive Choir, and Jordi Rosales on cello. Both songs were recorded at the Led to Life Oakland ceremony. The opening music under our manifesto is Jeremy Harris. I'd like to thank our fabulous team, Aidan McRae, Andrew Stores, Carter Lou McElroy, Erica Ekram, Aaron Wise, Francesca Glassbell, Hannah Wilton, Melanie Younger, and Suzanne Dollywall.